Could you take your seats, ladies and gentlemen? It's book. Hello, hello? Yeah. Good. Hello. Take your seats, please. Let's get started. Before, uh, before we hear from our last speaker, I just want to make uh, an announcement, just a reminder that it's the social dinner tonight and the buses will be leaving from the front of this building at 7.45. Sharp. <laughs> See you there. All right, our last uh, speaker today is Susan Carey, uh, and she's going to talk to us about the ontogenetic origin of abstract combinatorial thought. So I want to echo other people's thank you for um, inviting me to this conference. I've really, really enjoyed it. I'm going to impose upon you not the fruits of a very long research program which I, where I really understand how everything is coming out, but rather the beginnings of a research program, so bear with me. Um, but here's the problem. The human conceptual repertoire is a totally unique phenomenon on Earth. We're the only animals who can ponder the causes and cures of global warming, of pancreatic cancer, can, can reason about orders of infinity. In fact, we're the only animals that can think thoughts formulated in terms of the concepts that are lexicalized by most of the 500,000 words in English. And these are not words just for actions, objects, um, <clears throat> um, properties, right? I mean, the, the, this conceptual repertoire is astonishing in its variety. Um, <clears throat> babies can't think thoughts in terms of most of those concepts either. So how does this conceptual repertoire arise? That's a really unsolved problem in cognitive science and also in the history of analytic philosophy seem to be a central one. Now, as a matter of logic, um, this isn't the controversial claim. The form of the answer has to be a specification of the innate representational primitives that are the input to whatever learning mechanisms and a characterization of the learning mechanisms that get you from here to there. That's just a matter of logic. But that leaves open all kinds of possibilities about what that initial structure and what those learning mechanisms are like. Um, so this talk concerns the innate primitives, not the, the later conceptual development. And what we know from the last 35 or 40 years in development, co developmental cognitive science is that there are at least two kinds of very representationally rich, computationally complicated innate evolutionarily ancient primitives. Namely, namely sensory motor and even perceptual representations like depth perception and things like that. Those mechanisms are innate. Um, but also systems of core cognition, which have rich conceptual role, but are otherwise quite perception-like. So examples, I, I'm not going to go through this literature, um, representations of objects and actually of the physical world. That's where the physical knowledge needed for the paper we just heard um, came from. <clears throat> representations of agents, causal, intentional, communicative agents, representations of number, a variety, re representations of the social world. Um, <clears throat> um, but the existence of the, these two classes of primitives, I think, which are, are, are innate primitives, are very well documented, doesn't preclude there being other ones, right? Um, but these, these are the only ones we've looked for. Um, and so what I took on, for reasons I won't tell you, um, was the que about, I don't know, five or six years ago, the question of whether, in addition, part of the animal representational computational machinery or, and or could be different answers for babies, um, include non-linguistic representations that are a language-like language of thought. And by that I mean 
They have a, lo a lo language like logic like format, namely arbitrary unitary symbols. And they uh, participate in profligate uh, con combinatorial productivity. They have propositional content, they bear truth value, and they support deductive inferences. So the question is, do non-linguistic creatures have a Fodorian language of thought? Now, philosophers have debated this explicitly, at least since Descartes. And Fodor answered, obviously, yes, they must. What allows the central conceptual role? What allows the output from one module to talk to and interact with the, the output from another module? Um, and also, how do you explain the flexibility and productivity of animal behavior? But also, with respect to human babies in general, we clearly have such a representational system because we have language, right? And language um, has these properties. Um, but <coughs> Fodor asks, how could language be learned um, if the mental representations that underlie the meaning of language weren't available for the hypotheses about how the language works. Um, so that's a, supposed to be a priori arguments that just settle the issue. This is going to be widely found in, in the animal kingdom. But other philosophers have argued, obviously, no. Descartes, who raised this question in this modern form, argued, obviously, no. And Donald Davidson, a major analytic philosopher, also has an extended argument. Um, and um, I, I want to point out that there's two versions of an answer to Fodor's question of how it's possible to learn while still making it plausible that, not, that pre-linguistic babies don't have this yet. So one is that this kind of thought arises in hominid evolution with language. Um, and in ontogenesis, only upon learning a language, that is, the innate support of it is part of the language acquisition mechanism. There's going to be innate support for it, for sure. And babies have to have the machinery available to eventually learn it. That's not at debate here. Another possibility is it's present in non-linguistic creatures, but it's implicit. It's carried by the computation that explicit symbols enter into. And when you learn language, you somehow learn a vocabulary of explicit symbols that do this work. Um, so some more throat clearing. Um, I'm adopting here a representational computational theory of mind. I think it's the, common, the dominant paradigm in cognitive science. And if you adopt that view, you are committed to the existence of mental symbols. Um, this isn't the metaphor. This is dead literal. Um, and you are committed to these theoretical entry, entities because these are the inputs to further computations and the outputs of computations, which are the input to further computations. There's no computation without representation. Um, and you are committed to their being an answer to what those symbols are like. What's their format? Are they iconic? Are they analog? Are, do they have some other format? How does that format support its infer the inferential role. And what is the inferential role? And what gives those symbols the meaning they have? Right? Um, that is, they are representations. What makes them the representations there are? There must be answers to that question. And, if, and we have to, in principle, be able to make progress on answering them. And in fact, we have many examples where we've done so. So um, again, if you don't know this work, this won't mean anything to you. But once you find some evidence for some representational content in the mind of an animal or a baby or a human adult, for that matter, you go to work to ask, what is that representational system like? So there's lots of evidence for numerical content. That's a very abstract um, um, as, uh, property of, of the world. Um, and it turns out there's at least two systems of representation that um, that, uh, that have numerical content. One is the, the analog number system. This is the Hans number sense, um, in which number is represented, cardinal values are represented by s actual symbols that are analogs, analog functions of the cardinal value of the set. So there's length, an external analog um, representation. And the signature of this 
this kind of system. It's a very common coding scheme for all kind for lightness, bright, brightness, loudness, dimensions of experience. But there's what it, it's defined over. The system is used to represent number as well. The signature is that the discriminability uh, is a, uh, between um, cardinal values as a strict function of ratio. It th these representations um, respect Weber's law, scalar variability. But there's another one, which is um, the a system of parallel individuation, where the signature limit is an absolute set size signature. And it's totally insensitive to ratio, um, um, and this system works entirely differently. What you do is you set up, and this is a standard visual working memory models. We have these, babies have these, animals have these. Um, um, there's one symbol for each, you set up a mental model of the set that you're representing, and there's one symbol for each um, individual in the set. Um, and so the, the, indi the, the representation of the set the individuals in that stand in one-to-one -one correspondence to the set that's represented. Um, and furthermore, computations are defined over these models. You can represent two at once. You can, pair, can compare them on the basis of one-to-one -one correspondence, and therefore, therefore compute numerical equivalence. So there's numerical content here. There's a numerical content in the, in the procedures that set up the models in the first place that have to be sensitive to numerical identity. Is the object you're seeing now a, the same one or a different one that you already have in your model? Do you need to open a new object file? Um, so num there's no more numerical con concept than numerical identity. But this is, this is represented not with a symbol for numerical identity, but simply with computations that use it to set up the models such that the models stand in one-to-one -one correspondence, such that computations based on one-to-one -one correspondence actually do something about numerical equivalence. So it's shot through with numerical content. There isn't a symbol for number any place in that. Right? There's symbol for objects. That's, that's what the explicit symbols are. So, that, so, so not only do we, do, we, uh, do we worry about the format of these symbols and what computations they support, um, but this also says that sometimes the content is, is determined by, implicitly by the computational role and is not explicitly represented. OK. So, with those distinctions in mind, how is logic represented in non-linguistic creatures? Um, one, one, one last um, sort of throat-clearing thing. Um, if we adopt a representational computational theory of mind, it's vanishingly unlikely that the machinery of mental computation does not include AND gates or gates negation functions of various sorts, set representations functions. I mean, th no computational model that doesn't have those properties is even a candidate for what, what's needed to underlie any computations that happen um, in, in the mind. So why isn't our work done? Because the question isn't, does our computational machinery have to implement all of that stuff? The question is whether symbols for these logical functions are available to articulate animal and language thought, productively combining with any symbol available for thought. Right? So this requires that we distinguish within module computations from, um, from if you put, go back to Rich Ivory's talk, um, you, you want to distinguish the kinds of computations the cerebellum is doing from the kind, of, the kind of computations that the other error signal that the people were explicitly aware of and could articulate were doing, right? Um, so I owe you, in the course of developing this work, um, ways of distinguishing what counts as thought and what counts as perception, sensory motor representations, et cetera. Now, it may turn out that there's no computational difference between these two. That, I mean, that's what, that's what we're actually lo um, looking for. Um, but at least we need a place to start about how to divide the two. And so here's the first way to, to, to start it, and you'll see how it, how it plays out in the experiments, I'm going to say. Um, the, 
the thoughts are person level. Um, they, they're the representations that enter into the sort of last stage working memory models that determine the choices, actions, inferences that the person is making or, or the animal is making. Um, their very thought is photos central, domain general, um, talks to, uh, you know, interacts freely with other aspects of thought. Um, um, one way it's operationalized in the animal literature is that the representations on, on the cognition side of perception and cognition um, can, can learn arbitrary rules um, in a domain general way. Um, okay, so how do you, if, if you have an analysis of um, the, some property of, that would be on the thought side of a divide if there is a joint in nature, that's part of what, what the issues are here, um, how would you ever find out whether non-linguistic representations have that property in question. That's one reason this topic hasn't been studied much. It's not, you'll see, it's not easy to do that. Um, so th the research strategy has to be, we, you, you, you find some aspect of mental representations that would be clearly on the thought side if there is a thought side of a divide, okay? And then you come up with case studies of, uh, uh, that, that would, the, such that success in, in some behavior you see would seem to require representations of those properties. So the case study we chose was logical connectives. Why? Well, if there's anything that's on the Fodorian side of a language like logical, it's not going to be concepts of objects. It's not, I mean, it could be, it will be. They are, of course, they articulate propositional representations. But logical connectives have to. They can't be iconic or analog in format. They combine freely with anything that you can represent. So, so you know, you can, re you can replace arguments or variables with X. Um, 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 and, um, they support deductive inference. So can we find evidence for logical connectives articulating the thought of non-human animals or babies? That's the question. So the, the research strategy is you find a face valid task, and I'm gonna go through two, because I, it's important to look for domain generality, right? That's, because that's one of the signature um, properties of, of, of this. Um, and, um, to look for, for um, logical connectives, we decided to start with the disjunctive syllogism because there's actually a large lit animal literature purporting to show that animals can work through a disjunctive syllogism. Um, so the disjunctive syllogism is A or B, not A, therefore B. That requires or or not and requires that these combine by the rules of propositional logic. That's why it's a good case study on its face. Um, now, if you find patterns of success and failure, then your work just starts. Because if, if the animals or the babies fail, it's all, always possible they're failing for, for performance, irrelevant performance demands uh, of the task. The task is too hard, it, it masks a competence that they have. But also, if they, if they succeed, it's always possible that they're succeeding on the basis of representations that are different than the ones that you're probing for. That's, I mean, that's just how science works, right? And so, um, but once you, once you convince yourself that you really are getting at the content you wanted, then you're in the position to then start describing the systems, like in the analog magnitude system and in parallel individuation for number. So after you've ruled out deflationary alternatives for success, successes and failures, you want to do work that constrain the models of the format and conceptual role by exploring distinctive signatures of different formats and conceptual roles. So that's just how the work has to go. Okay, so what's the first task? The first task, this is in the literature already, with both babies and animals, mutual exclusivity, referent disambiguation. I look at that and I say to you, Look at the DAX, where's the DAX? And what adults do is point to the vacuum tube. Um, um, and why is this a face valid task for, for the disjunctive syllogism? Well, it looks like you're saying, one of those two has to be the DAX, can't be the cup, because that's a cup. Now, 
the way, whatever leads to the, crossing out that option, it could be a pragmatic inference or it could be a hardwired word learning constraint. It doesn't matter as far as the form of the inference. Um, there, so A or B, not A, therefore B. So uh, <clears throat> that's why it's a, on its face, it seems to be perhaps um, working through additional syllogism. So when, do, when can babies do this? This was work by Justin Halberta in his thesis when he was in my lab. Um, so he just did a simple preferential looking. He showed them those two. He said, look at the dot. Look at the cup. For the first things on some trials, look at the cup. Look at the cup. Um, and when you say look at the cup, what you're plotting here is you have a baseline preference for the cup and the dax when they're just looking at it. And then upon hearing, look at the cup, look at the cup, um, do they increase their looking towards the cup? So this is the, the uh, proportion of looking to the cup um, normalized by the baseline preference of looking. And you see from 14 months to 18 months, um, they increase their looking at the cup when you say look at the cup. The question is, what, what do they say when you say, where's the dax? Look at the dax. And what you find is that 17 and 18 month olds are like adults, they look at the DAX, but 14 and 15 month olds increase their looking at the cup. Um, so they fail. And uh, 15, 16 month olds are a chance. Okay, so it, this is showing an early success. In fact, this is um, the earliest success with this kind of paradigm, this has been replicated many times since then, is about 17 or 18 months. So this raises the possibility if, that there's some developmental change that makes working through a disjunctive syllogism become available around 17 or 18 months. Um, but there's leaner interpretations of success here, okay? This could be domain specific within learn, word learning, right? That's why we want to look at tasks across different domains. Um, but it's also that the strategy here might be something like map novel world, word to novel object. Um, and um, there's never any, prim they're never considering it might be A or B. They're never, they're never crossing out an option. They're just, they're just looking for a novel object to map to that novel word, right? Um, that's an alternative to the disjunctive syllogism. And many people think, that that's what's happening at these ages. So there's signatures that you can distinguish between working through a disjunctive syllogism or mapping novel to novel. And um, uh, one of them is um, just looking at the pattern of eye movements. Um, when you hear, look at the DAX. If you happen to be looking at the DAX, when you hear, look at the DAX, and you're just mapping novel to novel, you should be done. You should just stay looking at the DAX. But if you're actually working through a disjunctive syllogism, your eyes might go reflect the fact that your attention has gone back to the cup to reject the cup before you go back to the object. That latter pattern is what is seen between roughly late two-year-olds through adults. You see exactly that pattern of double check in the eye movements um, when, you're, when you're deciding what the DAX is. 17 month olds just stay on the, on the, um, the, the DAX. They don't show that pattern of double ticks. Now, this, this experiment wasn't designed to test for that. Um, and it, it really, if you really wanted to advance this, you would want to do that work systematically to really, really try to test for it. But there's another, another signature, which is what, the one that's gonna be more important in this work. You want to see some evidence that they've actually made the inference. They finished the inference here. And the way to do that is to test whether they learned the words, right? And so border collies and infants do what I've just told you already. But the question is, then suppose you've taught them that, that the vacuum tube, tube is a DAX and a, I don't know, an apple core, core is a blicket. You then show them the DAX and the blicket and you say, which was the blicket? Okay. Um, so did they actually learn the words? Did they follow through and map this new word to the thing, to the, to the thing that they increased their attention to? And you have to, of course, control for the fact that they had to learn two words and remember that, but there's no problem for children doing that um, if you just tell them the words and it's not the result of an inference. Um, so they can do that 
perfectly well? The answer is they don't learn the words until they're three, and border collies don't learn the words. So there's no evidence that they're actually worked, worked through the whole inference here, okay? Okay, so that, that's, that's the state of, of affairs with the disjunctive syllogism so far. So what we wanted to do is say, okay, this could all be something internal to the module of, of word learning. Um, um, can we look at other tasks with this structure, with, with the same structure? And so we did one fr that's from the animal literature. It's the uh, Joseph Call search task. Uh, he did it originally with four species of primates. And I love the animal cognition literature because when something interesting happens, then in the next five years, 40 more species um, are tested on exactly the same thing. And the, the finding is over wide ranges of mammals, birds, and primates, at least the majority of individuals tested spontaneously work through the inference that gives you a face valid um, evidence for the disjunctive syllogism, but not all species. And so then that's an interesting question about what the different ecology is, such that this, reading, this reasoning strategy might be, in, be available to this kind of lemur and not this kind of lemur. Um, so here's the task. I'll just show you the infant version of it because it's so simple. Yeah, you might stand up. Yeah, mom has to hold on. I know, this is less exciting. Oh, are you ready? Okay, hey, look where it's going. Okay, and look at this. And look at this. All right, where's the ball? Can you find the ball? This is a failure, oh. by the way. Where's the ball? A or B, not A. He looked at not A. There it is. Okay, so you, the ball's in A or B. You show them it's not in A. Of course, you counterbalance which bucket you manipulate first, whether it's the one that has it, it doesn't have, side, et cetera. Um, and um, you, you ask whether the child spontaneously, on learning it's not A, goes to B. Um, and um, the findings are 15-month-olds utterly fail, um, and 17-month-olds um, succeed wildly better than chance. And I mean, these are noisy, noisy data. Um, um, and um, there's no learning effect, right? They're just as good at the early trials as the late, late trials. Okay, notice this is the same developmental pattern as I just showed you in reference, in, in reference to disambiguation. Right? The, the information processing demands on this task, the basis of the inference are entirely different, but yet you're seeing the same developmental pattern. Okay, here is, oh, but, if you, want to, if, you, if you want to claim that something about the disjunctive syllogism is emerging around 17 months, you want to make sure that there's not a deflationary alternative of the failures at 15 months. So this is a complicated task. The child has to remember that there's a ball, and then they have to also keep keep track of this very complicated and distracting thing where she draws their attention to each bucket. Um, you know, one of them she manipulates and the other one she shows it's empty because she doesn't want them to go to one just because she's manipulated just one. And um, they have to keep the goal in mind and maybe they don't care that much about the ball. ball. So you want to control for all those low level um, um, sources of failure. Um, so here's a simple way of doing that. Just take the inference out of it, but keep everything else the same. So, oops. So notice that she divides her hand at the top okay, so they can see where the thing where is going. going. And so now what you find is 15-month-olds succeed perfectly well. So they only fail when they have to arrive at that, of that information from an inference. But otherwise, they're motivated to find the ball. They understand the task. They're not massively 
um, just thrown off by all that intervening um, uh, stuff. Okay, here's the third fa a face valid task. In the causal learning literature, um, there, uh, there's a, a type of task called, a type of inference called indirect screening off, which is simply the disjunctive sill syllogism within causal reasoning. So this is a, this is a ta task as is studied with children, and now the children literature has been taken to the animal literature, um, where um, there is a box, and you can place objects on the box, and some of those objects will turn the, turn the box on, and others don't, right? And the, the, the ones that turn it on are blickets. Some of these blo blocks are blickets, and some are not. And so um, in a no-inference, first you just show the child this one does, this one doesn't. You get the child to make the, the turn the box, make the, the box go, and this is, the kids love doing this. Um, and, uh, and then you have a, a no inference trial, trials with two objects. So you show them the green one does, the red one doesn't, and then you say, can you make it go? And the question is, can they remember which one did and, and didn't, and, and um, inhibit the choice to put on with the last thing they saw on it. Um, and um, uh, so those are the baseline control trials to show that they understand the task and, and are motivated to do it. Then the exclusion trials, you show them ambiguous information. So the yellow one and the purple one together make it go. Show them that a couple times. Then you show them one of them doesn't and give them the choice. So A or B, not A, therefore B. Okay. And um, we did this with 15 and 17 month olds chosen because of the last two experiments. Both groups are above, this is very hard. This is the youngest um, uh, um, success with Blicket detector task in, in kids that I know of. Um, so this is really hard, but the, um, both the 15 and 17 month olds are above chance on the no inference trials. And now we have the familiar chance at, at, at the ones that Support, supposed to do this, the disjunctive syllogism at 15 months and better than chance, the same as in the no inference, tri inference trials um, at 17 months. Okay, so there's a domain general change here, um, unless this is a massive coincidence, which it could be, of course, um, um, over referent disambiguation, search task, and causal inference. And so What's entirely open, although I'm going to try to show you some progress on deciding between this, is first of all, if this isn't a coincidence, and if the domain general change has something to do with the disjunctive syllogism, um, how is negation, or or for that matter, implemented in successful performance on these tasks from 17 months on? Because that's the candidate location of where the developmental change would be. Um, um, are the changes observed, changes in the relevant reasoning abilities involving negation, computations involving negation? Or is the change a change in information processing capacity allowing the demonstration um, of representational computational capacities in these tasks. That's still a deflationary account on these failures with respect to, it's still an interesting account. It would be something about executive function or something like that. But it wouldn't be, it wouldn't make these tasks be the tasks that you would want to ask my question. So how is negation implemented in successful performance in 17 month olds? There may be a domain general symbol for negation in the language of thought, not and um, conceptual combination, not X, not in the bucket, not the blicket, not the, not the cup. Uh, and that may be coming um, available. But there's a quite a different way of doing it, where the negation is implemented in a procedure, not in a symbol. So there might be an, a, a domain general uh, option elimination procedure, which works something like this. Represent the alternatives in working memory, eliminate on the basis of domain specific concepts, like empty or inert, Keep track of which ones have been eliminated because, because, because that's absolutely necessary to, for it to implement uh, this function of negation. But there's no symbol for negation involved in here. OK. There's a, there's a lot of evidence that not x, I mean, sorry, there's a little bit of evidence, a tiny bit of evidence that not x is not available to articulate thought in babies under 
um, 15 months. Because I'm going to tell you about three series of studies where people have tried to teach babies to learn arbitrary rules of the form not x predicts y. Um, and um, one of them is in the context of representations of abstract relations. And so just the finding, but I'd uh, a, a, sh show how it implements that, but then I'll show you how this works, is that 7 to 12 month olds learn the rule same predicts the puppet appears on the left in the face of failing to learn the rule, not same, predicts puppets appear, appears on the right. Okay? So you need the positive finding for the negative finding to be interested. So here's the paradigm. You're looking, the baby's looking at um, two windows there. And then um, either in, in that central place, um, two objects appear, two uh, uh, icons appear um, successively, and they're either identical to a blue circle followed by a blue circle or a, a triangle by a triangle, or they're different. If they're same, um, the thing appears on the left. If they're different, the thing appears on the right. Can they learn these rules? And the answer is, after about 24 trials of, of watching that, um, they start anticipating before the thing happens. So that shows they've learned the rules. So, then you have a series of test trials where nothing appears, so you get more anticipatory behavior. And what you find, um, this is the proportion of uh, correct anticipations, and this can be done with first fixations or total fixations or total fixation time, um, same patterns of results. The, per the, the percent or number correct minus incorrect over the total amount of anticipations, you see very, very robust success for the same rule, and they're at chance at the different rule. Now, this is actually quite striking, because it's not like they're discriminating not same or different from same. Um, they just didn't learn a rule, always look left or wherever same predicted. But they're, all they would have to do if, they're, if, if they've learned the rule same predicts left is the converse of that, and not same, it contrasts with it in the experiment, predicts right, and they don't. It's a chance. Okay? Um, so we then went on and looked at um, slightly older babies and learning the rules same shape and same, same color, same design, same design. Of course, the, the uh, test trials are completely novel uh, instantiations of these relations. Um, and the same pattern. They learn same shape predicts whatever, and they're at chance with, with different shape or not same shape. Um, and same thing for same color. Okay. Um, Ben Benitez, Varela, and Mailer um, use the same paradigm. Now forget the, um, don't pay attention. It's nothing to do with same different anymore. When you're looking at these, there's nothing on the screen besides those two, two things. But you either hear soma fa va, va, vi fi, a, a big long string of nonsense syllables. And that predicts left. And then 12 other long strings of nonsense, nonsense syllables all predict right. So you could learn this if you learn soma ve so tu ma ve fi predicts left and nubi ka fo we predicts right and 11 others. You just learn the first one predicts left and not that predicts the other. And what you get is you learn the rule so tu ma fe fi predicts left. Um, at your ch and your chance on the others. Again, you're differentiating them, and you don't learn not x in that context. Um, and a, f a third finding is that um, uh, Roman Feynman and, and um, uh, Fiery Cushman and I, um, oh, I didn't put the date on, um, um, tested whether children could learn the rule with the content the agent reaches for the ball um, uh, uh, when pr provided a choice between a ball and a bunch of other things, and not learn the rule, uh, ancient reaches, agent reaches for um, anything that's not the ball. Okay? So again, you can see this, we're looking for the same thing. So here they don't have to learn two rules, it's just one rule. It's, this is between conditions, 
Um, so what you do is, um, in the case where, they're re where it's the affirmative condition, the agent is reaching for the ball, um, the, the agent reaches for the ball, then you, you t take the ball, take it off this way, replace, uh, you've replaced, you've got another object there, you move the whole thing this way, now it's the ball and something else, and you replace that object there, so you can sh shuttle it back and forth, that's how you do this, but what the child sees, reaching for the ball, the ball, the ball, no matter what, you know, ball over A, B, C, D, E, F, G, till the baby gets bored, then, then you, you give them a new pair, um, and the question is, do they continue to expect that the baby will re that the per the agent will reach for the ball and not, not the not ball? Um, that's got to work for the other one to be interesting. Interesting, and the the other condition, the negation condition, is the baby reaches for anything but the ball, not the ball, doesn't want the ball. Negation in there, so they reach for. A instead of the ball, B instead of the ball, C instead of the ball. And after they've got bored with that, um, do they expect that when you see a new pair that they will reach for the non-ball? And the answer is I didn't put the slide in. Um, seven and 14 months do the affirmative one perfectly fine, um, and they're completely at chance. They have no expectation in, in, in the neg negative one. Um, whereas adults looking at those habituation um, movies and just ask to describe what happens, say, oh, he really doesn't like the ball. He didn't want the ball. He wants anything but the ball. I mean, it's just totally obvious. Um, okay. So, so this is certainly consistent with the view that, that babies under 15 months, the, all of these experiments are children under 15 months, um, um, don't have a symbol in the language of thought that's a negative operator that can combine freely with all of these other predicates. Um, and what might be changing at 17 months is that becomes available or the capacity to do that combination and, ho and hold that, that computation in working memory is, is becoming available at that age. Um, however, there's reasons to doubt that even that's what 17 months old are doing. How, Mel, how much time do I still have? Uh, okay, so I'm not, I, so, I'm, I'm, going, I'm not going to tell you this, but the, so I, I misjudged this. Um, basically, the next strategy that we had was to ask, when do English learners analyze no and not as two functional operators? That is, when do they learn the, the, the meanings of the words? No comes into their vocabulary when they're 12, 12, anybody who has a baby knows that no comes into the vocabulary very early. But it's used for denial. Right? It's not used, I mean, it's used for, for um, refusal. Do you want a bath? No. Do you want peas? No. Um, but you don't see in production babies producing negation to, to invert the truth value of a proposition until about 27 months of age. But that's production. So we looked at comprehension, and that's true of comprehension as, as well. They don't comprehend either no or not. Um, as truth functional connectives in language um, until after about almost a year and a half of having at least the word for no in their vocabulary. And that's what you would expect if there isn't a symbol around in the language of thought available to map that onto. Okay? So, so I think, <laughs> so this is, these are the experiments that show that. They're very similar, they use the same um, so I doubt that the top one is, is what's, where the developmental change is. I think that what's probably um, underlying success here is a, uh, an optional elimination procedure, which may um, actually implement uh, one function of negation. Um, but there's a reasons to doubt even that. Um, there's a leaner interpretation. So on this optional elimination procedure, um, you have to set up the options. If it's a disjunctive syllogism, you have to represent the logical relation between the options, such that when you, when you eliminate one option, you have a, dis, a, 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 a deductive certainty that it's B. If you've adopted those premises and you've worked through that syllogism, then it's got to be B. Um, but there's other possibilities. You could be representing the alternatives, especially because they're given visually 
But you just think, okay, there's some, it could be here, it could be there, maybe A, maybe B, proposite, maybe even 50-50 probability. When you eliminate the option, you don't update the probability at all. It's still just maybe there, but that's where you would look then because it's maybe there, right? That's not the disjunctive syllogism. Um, and also even a leaner interpretation is you're not representing the, the, the possibilities at all. You're just avoiding an empty, an empty container or an inert um, block in the context of the search task or the, uh, uh, um, okay. So how, how could you test that there, the minimal requirement for deductive certainty that they're updating the probability upon learning not A? Well, make there be two disjuncts, okay? So you hide one in, 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 in these buckets, one sticker you, in these cups one sticker in those cups, and then when you reveal it, you have, there's 50-50 there's probability in, in the green and the, and the, and the orange ones, and 50-50 in blue and yellow. Now when you show them one is empty, if you've work in, worked through the, the disjunctive syllogism, this is the pattern that you should expect. And so if you've worked through the disjunctive syllogism, you better go to the red one. If you're just eliminating an option and now looking at the remaining possibilities, you might go 33%, 33%, 33%, 33%. So this enables you to decide, to, to test the very minimal, I don't know how to know that they've updated the possibility to 100%, but I can tell you whether they're, they're updating the probability on the basis of this at all. Now you need a, a, you need a control trial that shows that the children understand, and a training trial, understand the structure of this task. So can they decide between a 50-50 and 100% if you don't have to arrive that by the inference? So here you just hide one between the two and one between in one, and then you ask them, and they know that they, they get to keep the sticker if they get it on their first try. So, so um, are they motivated to get it on their first try? Do they care about the stickers? Do they know how to go, to, go for certainty when there's no inference involved getting that certainty? And the answer is, yeah, this is hard for, the, this is two to five year olds. This is hard for them. Um, but they're all better than chance um, um, on, the, on the control trials. Now, what about these crucial test trials? Okay. The three year olds, four year olds, and five year olds, their performance is indistinguishable from the control trials. So this is a hard task, but there's no cost to getting to the certainty from the inference from three, four, and five-year-olds. The two-year-olds choose 33%, 33%, 33%, okay? And then I, I don't have time to show you. Um, we did the same thing in the Blicket Detector task, so now we have two sets of, 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 of ambiguous trials, so we have um, this, is, this is demonstrating this experiment. This is a slide I just showed you. Um, we show them that, that one between the, the yellow one and the purple one is a blicket, and then we have another pair, say a pink one and a gray one, and one of those is a blicket. Then we show them one of those is not, and so now we're in the same situation of 100, 0, 50, 50. When they are asked to make it go, do they pick the sure bet? Um, okay, the, the warm-up trials just teach them to put blickets on the, on the uh, you demonstrate the blicket makes go, you ask them to do it, they all do it. The baseline trials are the no inference trials from before. And now here are the test trials with two pairs. The two and a half year olds, 33%, 33%, 33%, three and four year olds, better than chance. Okay. So this is the same developmental pattern on three valid, face valid tasks of the disjunctive syllogism. Failure altogether between 15 months. Success at 17 months, but failure to show a probe signature of dedu deductive reasoning, right? Um, the sig signatures of deductive reasoning um, by age three across all three of those tasks. Okay, this could still be massive coincidence, um, but I'm beginning to think it's not. Um, so what's changing between 17 months and three-year-olds on the bucket choice and Blicket task? They have linguistic not by 26 to 28 months but they still fail to show, um, in the truth functional sense, um, but they still fail to show the signatures of disjunctive syllogism. So I don't think they're setting up the A or B premise. Why? Well, maybe you need linguistic or to do it. Um, a child these analyses of production shows that children produce and by two and 
by, by roughly 24 months. But ore is not seen in production till three. Um, conclusions. There's no evidence for a prelinguistic disjunctive syllogism. The animal literature, which is taken to show evidence that, that animals have propositional logic, um, is this disjunctive syllogism task. But it's just the two-bucket two, two version um, that, that 17 month olds are succeeding. And as I say, I think that, that even that, the logical content, if it's the optional, it, elimination procedure is implicit in the same sense, parallel individuation and number. Um, and it may not even be that because there's no evidence that they're actually updating the probability in um, B when you've, when, upon learning not A. And these controls haven't been done in the animals, but I'd be really surprised if the animals are better than the babies. Um, 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 so the final conclusions are, this is very early days in this research program. But the evidence, this is not what I expected. I thought it would be easy. I thought Fodor was right, right? I thought it would be easy to show evidence um, that, that the, the cognition of non-human animals and, and uh, babies, certainly, because they're going to learn language, um, uh, have the properties of a Fodorian language of thought. Um, but this evidence is consistent with the absence of prelinguistic symbols of logical connectives. One important component, but not the only one, of a Fodorian language of thought um, in infancy, not fully explored in animals. This, 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 these data are, are consistent with the possibility that propositional representations with language-like format, such as logical connectives, arise in ontogenesis only upon mastering their natural language expressions. Um, this could change tomorrow if I get a different task that, that's a face valid task that, that you know, but, but this is, we've really gone at this, you know, in many different ways here and found these systematic failures um, to either, to represent not X at all as the input to an arbitrary rule um, in kids under 15, 15 months, and we don't know in the older age, and probing for the signature of deductive certainty and failing to find it across the way. Um, uh, so that's the argument I'm making today. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we certainly have time for questions. Sandy. We have a two, someone who doesn't really count as in the back. <laughs> take the back person first. No, the back is Rich Ivory. Oh. <laughs> it, that was a beautiful tour de force. And I'm surprised too that they don't have the. Well, at least they, we can't. That we haven't shown it, it earlier. Yeah, yeah. But the question is in your final conclusion, could you just expand a little um, and tell us how they could learn if the missing link is to learn the natural language expression? for logical not or or. How do they learn it if they don't have the requisite so, concept in the first place on the view? Yeah, so that's what, what bootstrapping models are, right? Is it, it, uh, and so the idea would be, there has to be innate support for this. Um, and there, there's no doubt. So these children, the, at the age at which they're not doing this, they clearly have propositional representations. These are two and a half year olds. They know most of English, right? Um, so they have the argument structure and the semantic combinatorial rules and the, um, and the syntactic combinatorial rules um, to, um, to represent propositions, no doubt about that. But it may be, well be that you need the, rep the represent, that, that the innate support for learning logical connectives, have to operate on those, right? Um, so, so you have so so um, so the, the idea is that part of the language acquisition device has to be the content needed for 
the expression of quantifiers in language, the, the expressor, the, 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 the semantics underlying um, uh, um, uh, logical connectives. I mean, they just structure all languages, right? Um, um, so it's there, but it's, it's part of the language acquisition device, right? Um, um, and and it, it's only defined relative to propositions as represent. So one thing in the data that I didn't show you, which was the language learning part, it was just the same task. You hid something in either a bucket or a truck, but now instead of showing them it's empty, um, you just tell them it's not in the bucket, right? And what you find is that two-year-olds just ignore the not, and they look in the bucket equally whether you say it's in the bucket or it's not in the bucket. Um, and these kids are not producing not yet, and they're not producing, in their, in their speech, they're not producing um, uh, neg propositional negations. Um, and it's not until 27 months when they are producing it, they use that for not. But that's not. Um, so we, we, did, we also did the same thing for no, and it's the same thing. No has been in their vocabulary for, forever, but now the question, the mother says, is it in the bucket? And, and the experimenter says no. It isn't, or yes, it is. Um, and the, the two-year-olds ignore the no and look in the bucket if, in, in both of those cases, and it's not till 27 months that they, they get it right. But they get the, they need to know, they, they do just barely better than chance on the affirmatives um, um, at 20 months. They're better than chance, and, the, and they don't distinguish the two, the affirmatives and the negatives. So the, the representation of the positive propositions are changing over this time as well. Um, so, so it's not a magical, I don't think it's a bootstrapping story like in the history of science or number, right? I think it's it, that there is innate support for this, but the innate support is in the, con, the, the, the constraints on the semantics of um, propositional representations within language. Yeah, yeah, they need the language. They need the, you, you can't even entertain the possibility that no is, the, is a, 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 a function word that, it, that inverts the truth value of a proposition if you can't represent the proposition on the fly because you wouldn't get the evidence to do that, right? So this says it's internal to the language acquisition device. That's, the, that's what the, the constraint on learning these words are. Um, um, but it, but what, what's left open by these data is that until that happened, happens, you don't have a symbol for, that, for those functions in the language of thought. Right? That, that, that could be true. It's a, language, it's a language learning problem, and it's just a mapping problem. You already had it, and, and that, that just explains what's hard about the mapping. So we have ex experiments trying to tease out those two possibilities as well. Um, you, you say that it's something that develops as, as within language, but you have no evidence for that. Mm. That's your belief, right? So the, the evidence is only that um, there is a close relation between the performance right. on the non-linguistic tasks and, and when they map, when they learn the words for these. But that causation could be going in either direction. Exactly. But we have a research program in collaboration with, with um, Agnes Kovacs and a graduate student of hers named Esther Zabo um, and Roman Feynman, who's the person who, who, who's, who's all over this work, um, looking at cross-linguistic comparisons between Hungarian and, and English. And there's a variety of reasons that are too complicated to mention that Hungarian might be expected to be, have an easier, easier language learning problem for kids. And indeed, the children learn the, ex the Hungarian expressions of, um, of negation um, four to six months earlier than English do. Right. Um, so it's no doubt that part of the problem is just internal to learning language. But now the question becomes, um, does that, it's certainly, it's certainly not the case that the success at 27 months in English learners has to await a linguistic, a language learning independent conceptual change that's maturing or, 
learn by some other mechanism, because then the Hungarian kids shouldn't have it, right? Um, so, but, but we don't know that the, that learning in, in Hungarian is making something available to them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, so that, okay, but so, that's where we're going. So, even yeah. so, so this leads me to, to, to the question I want to ask. So uh, uh, Piaget went, went out of fashion some time ago. Are you reviving him? This, I've always, I, I've always, is looked, it? absolutely. Look. So, so, so let me finish my comment. So, so is, is then really uh, perhaps, and I don't know how to, to do this, but to seek back in this notion of abstraction réfléchissante, a kind of principle that explains how these things may come about, but that this notion that he attributed to seven years is really a general principle that works all the way back. Uh, and so well, this particular, this is, this is the essence of his transition to formal operational thought. So I'm not reviving Piaget in that way. That's totally ridiculous, right? Because Piaget never looked at the structure of language. And logical, log, the logical connections of language, uh, the natural semantics um, has all, all of the pro signature properties of a Fodorian language of thought. Yeah. Yes. So people see me as a radical nativist, um, and that's because um, I am, in the sense that um, that there, I think there's ma massive um, innate representational machinery available. You'd never learn anything if, if it wasn't, and it's an empirical question how rich its content is and how, what its computational properties are. I think that those questions can be asked and answered, um, but I'm also a discontinuity theorist. I was always a Piagetian in that sense, but all of the work before has been within specific domains. So conceptual changes with intu intuitive theories in which actually new primitives are coined, right? So I have always been interested in discontinuities in development. And this is not an area where I thought, and I still don't know that, that, that I should think, right? Um, uh, this, 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 this is not an area where I thought this would play out this way. But we have a second case study on, on abstract relations, which is what the same different part was actually part of. It's coming out exactly the same way. So, so I, you know, I'll be forced. I don't think there's anything logically incoherent about it. So there are learning mechanisms that can actually affect these changes, and these are the bootstrapping processes. I don't think this is that kind of bootstrapping, but it still could be a representational change where you have to um, gain access to these explicit representations within language first before you can use them in thought more generally. That's, I think, not an incoherent position, and it might be true. And then that would be a real discontinuity, because whatever, con whatever logical content is available to the representational and computational system in non-human animals and in pre-verbal infants, it would either be implicit, you know, uh, or explicitly represented, like in the analog magnitude system, but in a way very different from the way it is in language, such that it wouldn't even combine with a negative operator, even if you had one, right? And so we can go to work and explore, ex explore between those two possibilities. So I'm just open to that possibility. I don't think, I, I mean, I made the argument today that we should take those possibilities seriously. I don't seriously think by any means that I've shown. This is, as I said, really early days of how you start on such a research program. This question, nothing. Okay, better? Okay. It wasn't entirely clear to me if it's a difficulty with negation or a difficulty in updating the probabilities of something based on what you learn about something else. So I think you'd have to do some sort of and 
what if you show this happens to object A means that that happens to object B? Well, Do you try that? We, the reason we haven't done and is that and is just everywhere. So every time you open, suppose you're setting up an object file representation in working memory. Um, so I show you this cup and I put it behind the screen. Then I show you this cup. And because it's spatially temporally distinct from this, um, it is um, a, different, a different cup. So I put it down here. And now you expect two. OK, you've done an end there. You've got to, to set up this model of two, you had one, and you added a second. But, but that's, there's no symbol for and there. I don't even know how to begin looking for a symbol for and in non-linguistic thought because the various, the very, 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 all the very concatenations that you do implement and. Um, so I agree with you that, that the, the problem might be updating probabilities, but animals and babies update probabilities all, all the time, right? Yeah, but about different things. Yes, so about, of course, of course. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I mean, you're completely, you're, you're completely right um, that, the, but the question is, why aren't they updating the probability? Why aren't they updating the probability in this case? Um, so what we're doing now is actually, we, we, I mean, we are actually, I, 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 that's a, we're actually trying to, to make progress on just this question by seeing whether uh, toddlers at the age at which they're failing at this at least are sensitive to the probabilities in, ris in risky choice decisions. So what if you have a choice between a sure bet and a choice of four, <laughs> where it's one of those four? Are they, is that difference from when there's a choice of eight or a choice of two? Are, are, they, are they sensitive to those probabilities? Um, um, in a way, we already showed that in the control task where there's a choice between two and a choice of one. But we're not convinced that that's the basis on which they actually did that task. So maybe, so maybe, the, control, maybe the control task doesn't show that they have that capacity at least to, um, uh, to even represent the probabilities and be sensitive to them in making a choice. So we're doing that. And then if we can, we can look at their, their, their capacity to update them when it doesn't require an, inf uh, an inference, right? Um, so yes, I agree that that's um, so something we need to do. Uh, one up here and then uh, Rich Ivory at the back. This one. Hi, hello. So um, I would like if 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 you want to tell us more about the first part of the story that that you told us today, the part of the transition between uh, the age of fifteen and seventeen, mm -hmm. and I, what what are what are your, your view about that? Because the the you have this consistent pattern of results in a series of tasks in which, uh, um, for I mean, I, I think that there is evidence that uh, non-human non uh, um, animal species succeed, succeed in this type of task uh, with the, 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 the bucket task, uh, this causal learning uh, by exclusion inferences, as well in some kind of form That's of right. uh, um, um, novelty to novelty mapping. And I'm, I'm curious why, why, why do you think that, what is your view about the yeah, failure of the, a, of the so younger that's infants? That's a very good question. So it's, it, it could be that um, what's changing between 15 and 17 months is building the right form of an option elimination procedure, even the maybe A, maybe B version of it. Um, you need to tag those options when you've eliminated. So look, every time you do a choice, so, so you're, suppose you're, you're, you're an animal or a baby and you're searching for something. So you're searching for a ball somewhere on this table. So you look here, okay? It's not there. Okay, you then go search someplace else, right? Um, but that's not, but if you haven't explicitly set up a space of alternatives, 
and tag this one as eliminated, then this procedure, you could randomly search back to that, right? And so the question is, when do they actually set up a deliminated set of, of, of options and keep track of the ones they've crossed out? And maybe that procedure is still getting compiled or something at this age and becomes available in this domain general way, because that's what all of these tasks were at that age. But the other possibility is, no, 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 that, that's, that's not a problem. I mean, um, um, the, the problem is the, I mean, executive function working memory is changing incredibly over these ages. And so maybe what's changing here are the, the, the working memory capacities that um, allow you to actually implement these procedures and these tasks. And, and we chose tasks that really made on their, on their surface really different working memory demands. But they all, and they all require a kind of inhibition as well, because you have to inhibit attention to the one that I just showed you. It's not X. And we've, we've, we've ruled out that that's the source of the problem. So that, that was something we actually designed experiments to, to our control experiments and the way we counterbalance things show that there's no, that's not the problem. But updating working memory um, could be what's developing here. And um, then, then it would be continuous with the animals that that, that, that option elimination procedure um, is available in a domain general way um, um, uh, in infancy. Um, and it does implement a genuine form of function of, of negation, but it doesn't allow you to think thoughts like, if not A, then B, or, um, or even not A predicts left, or not A, a predicts. So it's not, it's not the form of negation that we need for a Fodorian language of thought, even though it is ge a genuine form of, just like parallel individuation has genuine um, uh, 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 numerical content. So I think that might be the right story, and it makes sense of the fact that these are adult animals. Um, um, so I, I think that might be right for the, for the developmental case. Um, but here's a little hint. We can't take this result home to the bank yet, but the Hungarian children who learn the linguistic expression of negation four to six months earlier than English children succeed on the non-linguistic two-bucket task at 15 months. Um, so this suggests that actually um, that, that there might be some change internal to, to representation of negation in, involved. I mean, we can't. We have that result. They're, they're statistically better than chance, but they, they aren't statistically different from the English kids in the one experiment we've done yet. So I, I don't know that that's true. But you could see what we're going after there um, uh, to say that it might not only be a development of the executive function. Rich, there are very few of us left. What? There are very few of us left. Uh, <laughs> So I, I know it's early days here, but you, uh, you set out sort of the question was, does the uh, uh, language of thought sort of serve as this precursor, right, for conceptual development in language? And the question is, suppose that, you know, we buy, you know, the end result is that we can dispense with that as sort of serving this purpose. Then uh, is there a place for keeping the idea of language of thought in the adult mind? Should we dispense with that too? What would be the status for? That sort of concept in the in the adult mind. It, I, yeah, I mean, uh, the the reason for that is um, the non-linguistic representations that you need to support the meanings, the, the combinatorial properties of English, right? I mean, we think often in English, so the the language of thought may be English. That's why it has the properties of a natural language. That's the but question. But it's still right. a language of thought, right? Well, no, because then it's not. I mean, right? The whole language of thought notion is that it's obeying the properties of a language, but not really the language. No, I, of, right? It's no, not. no, I agree. I I, complete, I I completely agree. This an extreme version of of um, 
of, of the way I presented it today um, is consistent with the view that the, that the Fordarian of language of thought simply is okay. language, um, in which case it doesn't do the work. You know, in which case the story comes down on the Davidson um, Descartes side. That's right. So you could do the thought experiment of um, take an adult, and if you had some magical tool to disconnect the language system, they'd also fail on your. Mm. <laughs> we already know that that's not right. Okay. We don't know that. We know that that the language of thought scaffolds um, that sorry, language learning scaffolds, for example, being able to do explicit theory of mind tasks, um, and also. Um, number tasks, you know, to learn arithmetic. But once it's learned, deep aphasics um, can still do them. So you end up um, with a representational system that doesn't require language as a medium um, to be implemented in any, any given task. So, I don't, I, so I'm, I, I don't go all the way that you have to think in English in order to think this way. But it may well be that you don't get the, the representational structures that enable you to think this way until so you you've them. mastered them in yeah. English. Well, we have two more questions, and then, um, then it's two plus. Is it time for the bus already? No. So I'm dying to hear about the difference in Hungarian, and I know that you don't have time to do that. So I'm looking forward to the banquet tonight mm -hmm. to hear that, because it's going to be a crucial piece of the evidence. But in advance of having that, or even if I said to you, I don't believe it for a minute, the Hungarian language, whatever, shouldn't have the negation, or it shouldn't have not earlier. Couldn't, that raises the question, couldn't you do some individual analyses? Yes, yes. So you should be able to make individual differences. Absolutely. Different, mm -hmm. the, so that's the other next line of experiments to do. This work calls out for individual right. difference studies. So you can look, look you at- Or you hold constant you, you, other or capacities. Or also priming studies. If, right. there, if there's really something in common across these right. things, you know, if you've got kids doing negation in the bucket task, does it help them on the bucket task, right? Or are at least there's a lot of variance in those 17-month-olds. They're just slightly better than the chance. Lots of them are like 15-month-olds. Yeah, right. A lot of them are like 19-month-olds who, who are much closer to ceiling. So are the ones that are bad at the blicket detector task also bad at the, at the I mean, at the either, either one? Um, uh, so that at least would give you stronger evidence for domain generality. Um, but you could also then do individual uh, uh, differences tasks looking at measures of exact working updating working memory, for example. The reasons we haven't done that is those studies, these studies require 24 babies, uh, uh, 24 toddlers at each age. Um, that's still big studies as developmental right. studies go. Those individual different studies, to be good, require 100. And, and so it's a big investment. And you wouldn't want to make that investment until Absolutely. you at least had this body of work. Um, and so we might, if I can get a graduate student or a postdoc to want to do that. Or bring these I, babies I back, knowing what they did, knowing what the babies did at 17 months, bring them back n months later and have them do another task and see if there's some uh, elevation. There's, there's just, it's just too close to chance. To yeah, have. never mind. But I like the idea <laughs> of going individuals. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's been in the Hungarian at the last Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't know. Should be proud of this, or, or uh, uh, <laughs> uh, um, maybe that's why Hungarian is supposed to be so hard to learn for other <laughs> people. Anyway, um, um, I really these are exploratory questions instead of uh, we'll have time to uh, about specific points. But you mentioned, but you did not elaborate the um, the connection between. This, uh, you know, ac acquiring the knot and uh, uh, connectives and uh, uh, truth functional understanding, uh, understanding tru uh, truth and truth functions, counterfactual counter reasoning, and uh, um, and babies also propositions. So it's not immediately obvious why for uh, proposition representations which you need in order to combine them, okay. But why would you ha need uh, 
for subject argument structure um, or uh, several argument uh, uh, relational structures, like I give this to him. Um, why would you need negation? You don't need negation, uh, but you need negation. Um, um, negation is a function which, if it's true that I like cookies, then it's false that I don't like cookies, right? And so, so the point is, so there's two an analyses. So to address the question that, that this, you're coming back to the question I asked you at the end of your talk, to, to address the question of when in development or when in, in evolution um, there are true propositional representations in non-linguistic thought, you need an analysis of what counts as a true propositional relation. And there's two analyses in the philosophical literature. One is sentence internal. Um, um, you have to be able to build trees um, and, and assign negation at various parts of the tree so that some, one function of negation is like not green. That's not, a, that's not uh, anything that's not green, okay? You can, that, that tells you, you know how to, 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 you can make a verification procedure for that. Um, and what it does is pick out the complement of the set of things that are, are green. Um, um, and that is, is taken by some philosophers as um, a, a, a hallmark of, of propositional representations is that you can do those kinds of operations. Not, negation isn't a, a privileged one um, uh, on um, uh, internal to the sentence and, and there's very regular functions. So pro the, the hallmark of propositional representations is the nature of the relations internal to a proposition. Another is, no, 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 the hallmark of, of propositional, uh, of logical connected propositional representations are, are just what you need for the truth tables of propositional calculus. Um, and if that's so, negation is absolutely necessary because that's the whole content of it, right? Um, is, it's the whole content is the logic of the propositional calculus, um, which is what you can do over if, then, and, or, and not. Period. That's just what propositional representations are, in which case you need them to have propositional representations. So, and I don't know, I, I don't know what, what, what the, all I know is that there are these two analyses in the philosophical literature. I think it's ma amazing that philosophers would debate which is the right way to think about propositions. It seems to be, they're both good questions. Um, um, but why? It, but, so you were assuming the former, in which case I then agree with you, that, that, that the, just the argument structure in the, within the affirmatives already shows that you've got propositional representations, right? Um, and you don't need get negation for that, um, although you need that for negation. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I think so. yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Sid. Thank you. Thank you. Seven forty five out front. Okay. Yeah, so here we go. Where is it?